Uh, welcome, everyone, and good evening. I call to order the April 11th, 2022 business meeting of the Cincinnati Board of Education. We welcome everyone and request everyone in the audience to silence your cell phones and electronic devices. For folks viewing at home, our blue jeans should be ADA compliant with transcription and translation services, uh, and there should be a link um, on the welcome screen uh, where you can access both. Um, would our uh, treasurer for the evening please call roll? My pleasure. Ms. Fulton. Present. Mr. Craig. Here. Ms. Jones. Here. Dr. Moffitt. Here. Mr. Morosky. Here. Mrs. Weinberg. President Lindy. Here. Uh, members of the public who wish to speak may do so by clicking the chat button now. The chat feature will be open for your requests for five minutes. Please submit your name, your affiliation, your school community, your topic, and your contact information if you would like a direct response to any questions that you may have. And so we're going to start this evening with the first item on our agenda, which is the three-month board priorities. If uh, Rob could bring up our slide here. Do we, do we need a motion for a treasurer pro tem tonight? Sounds like we do. Okay, can we have a motion for a treasurer pro tem, please? So moved. Is there a second? Any discussion? Who do we nominate? Mike, thank you for joining us. Um, can you remind all of us your last name? <laughs> My last name is Gustin. Mike Gustin. Gustin. Thank you so yeah. much. Jen did send that to me in advance, and so that oversight is on me and nobody else. So thank you for being here. Um, any other discussion before we vote to make Mike our treasure pro tem this evening? I would just like to say that I'll vote in favor now that I know it's Mike. I trust Mike. <laughs> he wasn't so sure before, but now now we're in a good spot. Not Brandon. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, can we please uh, call the vote, Mike? Thank you. Yes, Miss Moulton. Uh, aye. Mr. Craig. Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Dr. Moffitt? Yes. Mr. Morosky? Yes. President Lindy? Yes. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. So now, with that in place, we'll move on to our next agenda item, which is on our uh, three-month board priorities, which you can see up on the screen. Um, so as a, as a way to get started here, I wanted to remind everybody what these are and where they came from and uh, why they matter. Um, these are the handful of things that we decided um, matter most over the course of the next three months, so between 3.7 and 6.13. Um, I'm noticing that they say 1, 2, 4, 5, which is a, a great look for a school district. Um, and I, I apologize because I'm sure that's my fault because I made this slide. Um, so uh, now that that's fixed, uh, we're all about continual improvement, so we've got that correct. Um, and uh, the, these came from a discussion we had at the meeting on March 7th um, to uh, discuss and, uh, and ratify as a board what's the small number of most important things for us to move forward over the next three months. Um, part of what I think shared accountability for that means is that we come back to each other and to the public, maybe not every meeting, but meaningfully often between the 7th of March and June 13th to share an update on how we're doing on the things we said mattered most. Uh, so we're going to do that tonight uh, for just a couple of minutes. Um, and the way I'd like to proceed is what I shared with everybody earlier, um, which is to, for, for each one, uh, either I or another board member who's been proximate to that work can share a few updates with each other and the public. Um, give everybody a chance to share any other feedback or ask any other questions. And then we'll just go down the row, starting with Mr. Morosky to Mr. Craig all the way down. And I'm going to ask everybody to share a, a color for how, how you see our um, progress at this point. And we're going to use a scale created by Mr. Craig. Uh, so what, what Mr. Craig suggested was that you're going to give it a green if 
the item is either complete or substantially completed. You get to decide what that means. That's green. You're going to give it a yellow if something is started or slightly off track. You're going to give it a red if it is off track or not started yet. Okay. And so, again, we'll invite uh, either myself or another board member to share some updates on what's happened. Not long, but quick. Give everybody a chance to ask some questions. Give everybody a chance to share their color. And then I'm going to ask Rob, we're going to assign like the, the, um, the equivalent of like an average rating from everybody um, so that the public can see where we are, so we can see where we are, and so that we see movement um, between now and next time. Uh, any questions? Okay, so on the first one, which is ensuring that the new superintendent has a strong start, we said that concretely we want to help her establish strong working relationships inside and outside the organization, and that we're on schedule to have measure a goal, measurable goals informed by her assessment, assessment of the district by July 1st. So I know she shared some information um, with us about her plans around meetings she had, meetings she will have, There's a lot more that needs to happen. Um, but I do think this is very started uh, and, and, and from my perspective where it needs to be. Um, anybody want to share any other questions or, or just commentary on number one? Okay, all right. So, Mike, would you give that, is the, uh, give it a color for us? I would say, <clears throat> as it's written, I would say green because we are on schedule. I mean, we don't have the measurable goals, but the way it's written, I would say we're well on track. Mm -hmm. Okay, so green, according to Brandon, is completed or substantially completed? Yellow. So let's we'll make it yellow, yellow. Um, because it is it is started. Um, uh, so so we'll go with yellow. Uh, Mr. Craig. Uh, yeah, it would be yellow. Also, I think we are uh, on track, and I just don't know if we've made it substantially to permitting assessment measurements. Thank you, Ms. Bolton. Yeah, I think we're on yellow, and I would worry uh, if we said we were green or red or whatever. So I think yellow, I think we're on track. I think we're progressing well. I would suggest that it's possible that maybe the chairs of the committee, board committees might want to have an opportunity uh, to write down and update um, where those committees are working in greatest depth just to make sure she's caught up uh, with where the board is via committee. Sounds good. Thank you. Ms. Jones? Yellow with no comment. Dr. Moffitt? Yellow. Um, I think everyone's pretty much said where we are. Okay. All right. Good deal. Thank you. So we'll make that one yellow, Rob. Um, moving on to supporting the passage of a strong FY23 budget. Uh, we said that was going to mean a positive five-year forecast informed by an analysis of what's been working for students and involved meaningful stakeholder <laughs> feedback. Um, maybe somebody from the finance committee want to want to start off on how that's going. I would just start with I think that's yellow. Uh, we're deep into it, and I know that the current administration's been working hard with the uh, incoming superintendent to uh, to uh, compare data and also understanding that this next budget is going to be a budget of the new superintendent, but highly informed by the work that's been done by the current administration, and I would point out that the treasurer has been working very closely with the, with the incoming uh, superintendent, as well as I would point out the, the couple of dates that we have in, uh, I believe, May that are for community engagement and encourage folks to attend those to help get the community more involved with the budget preparation. Uh, thanks, Ms. Bolton. Um, so we started with, with Mr. Morosky this time. We'll do that again, but next time we'll start down at the other end just for some variety's sake. Yellow. Thank you. Greg? Yellow. Okay. Ms. Jones? Hello. Yellow. Dr. Moffitt, yellow? All right. Wonderful. Um, moving on down, so we've got our third one, which is support the adoption of a strong transportation plan for school year 22-23. Um, would anyone like to? We're going to have an update on that tonight. Uh, I don't know that I have a ton of new information since last time, other than that I know everyone's working on it, and I'm looking forward to, to learning and hearing more. Um, certainly know that it started uh, and that we have some more work to do. Anybody have any questions or other feedback they'd like to share on this one? 
Yeah, Ms. Bolton. I would uh, I would say that uh, we're sort of on schedule, although certain things are needing to be done for our uh, compatriots in the charters and non-CPS schools where they they're on a different timeline than our CPS folks are. Uh, but it looks like we've been making progress, and I know that they are in the process of conducting the optimization uh, uh, efforts, which uh, show some promises. But most importantly, we, according to general counsel, are going to need to negotiate a new contract with uh, SORTA, uh, a, con a full contract that's, that has not been done since 2017, I think. Uh, so that's uh, in the works and will require board involvement. And again, appreciate the work of the administration to get us a lot farther in this transportation planning than we've seen in the last couple of administrations. Thanks, Ms. Bolden. So starting with Dr. Moffat this time. I think we're at a yellow for that. Ms. Jones? Yellow. Ms. Bolden? Yellow. Mr. Craig? Yellow. Mr. Murawski? Yellow. All right, great. Maybe a bright yellow. Bright yellow. Um, a very strong yellow. A strong um, yellow. It looks good. Uh, so number four, last one, which is begin a governance coaching series so that we will have selected a program, started it, done a first self-assessment. Uh, and there are some topics listed there that the program would cover. Um, would anyone like to share an update on this with the public? Uh, so yeah, I'll share. We did at the last board meeting, um, we've presented the recommendation there and we've begun the process of reaching out to uh, begin that contract talks, at least to get the idea of what the full contract would look like based on the bid. I think there's still some measurables that we have to figure out with regards to how we will do the first session, which is a kind of a retreat style session they wouldn't wanted to do. Um, but we are working hard to um, get those information together and that we do already have a kind of a dollar amount that they've already bid out in the original bid that we can work off of, so. Uh, will you see, while we're with you, will you suggest a color for us? Uh, I would suggest yellow at this point. Great. Uh, any Anybody find a color other than yellow for this one? Ms. Bolton? I think we're green, but uh, because I think a majority of the board expressed an interest in acting on the recommendation from the committee uh, that was checking things out. But I would suggest that I, as I share with President Lindy, I do think that parts of the RFP that this specifically could relate to strategic planning should be handled by ALMA. And indeed, the RFP does make it possible to have uh, multiple vendors uh, with specific issues. But I think that Great City Schools is a, a direction to go. But if we really want to do, as I think the incoming superintendent has said, to get right on the job of the strategic plan, uh, I think the credibility that Alma established and the work that they did could be incorporated as part of this RFP. But the general work, definitely, Great City Schools, but strategic planning, I'd like Alma to be a participant. And you said that, what color did you say? I said green. You said oh. green, okay. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm gonna go with, I, I'm, from my perspective, it, our definition of green is completed or substantially completed. And so is. because we haven't started it yet or done the self-assessment yet, I'm, I'm gonna keep it at yellow for me. Okay. Um, but that's, you've got Eve, me, and Brandon. Mr. Morosky, where are you? Yellow. Yellow, Ms. Jones? Orange. Orange. <laughs> I feel a purple coming at some point, Dr. Moffat. You no, know, I was definitely gonna come up with something different other than those three. Green. No. I, I think what? it was, oh, I'm no, sorry. No, you, we're gonna keep going, go back to you. I hope so. you didn't finish your one. I didn't finish, right. but it, it, sorry, I had a moment. Um, I, I, I think there's lots of questions that we have to ask about that. I'm still confused about the process for how we decided Great, uh, Council of Great City Schools. Not that I'm not a supporter of Council of Great City Schools, but then there were the questions about the Alma group. We haven't had a chance to talk about the RFP stipulations, although we did get it at request. Um, so to me, there's still a lot of things that we need to sort of consider and, and finalize. So it's somewhere between a yellow and a red for me. 
Okay, that's good. Thank you, uh, Vice President Jones and Dr. Moffitt. Well, I don't, I don't give it a green because clearly we're not done. And um, I, I, I'm, I'm concerned about a red because we have, we have begun the process. We did have the RFP. We got several emails about, check it out. If you're, I mean, it was, there was, we were emailed out by Brandon and Mike about questions regarding the RFP, if you have any concerns about it, which um, I don't think I responded, but, but I did see them. And so um, I, we selected Council Great City Schools last week. I just don't think that we have selected the program. We have not started it. We have not done a first assessment as a board. And there is some question around role clarity. So, you know, as far as board members. So I just think that we're not, there, there should be maybe another choice. Orange. orange, okay, I like the orange thing. But um, I mean, we did have, we had, we had some discussion about it. Yeah. We, you know. So, so for tonight, I think the most important thing is that we um, surface areas where there's still more work to do, uh, and that we're we're accountable to ourselves and to the public to make sure these things happen. So, more work to do. Let's make it orange for tonight. Um, uh, why feel limited by categories? Um, and um, I think we'll we'll make sure that this is moving forward. Uh, and I think if this is a success, what should be true when we come back to this on the ninth? Um, I know I'm being a little, um, you know, playful with the colors, but I do think that the, the core of this is something that's really important, which is that we're clear ahead of time on what we think matters most. We declare in advance what winning looks like, really concretely, and then we hold ourselves accountable for making sure those things happen. Um, and I do think I'm very happy to be working on this with you all, because I think we are making some important movement on, on things that do. Um, so, uh, uh, Ms. I would only add, I think we're supposed to be voting on it tonight, so that's in part why I was at green. Um, but I'm happy to make it yellow since I still think there is a lot to be done, especially from the strategic planning part and the one sentence that would allow two vendors to do different things. So I'm happy to change my color. Mr. Craig? I just wanted to clarify that what we uh, recommended and in what we are t in the talks with is and what will be part of the proposal today in the budget is the authorization to, for that one session that would, would have been within this budget period. Um, so what we still have to do is negotiate that contract with Great City Schools, or if, if that doesn't, that recommendation isn't what we, as a board, decide we want to go with that contract, then we can always change that. But I think, at least for right now, what we kind of talked about at the last, at the previous meeting was that the proposal fit with what we were looking for from a budget aspect as well, and as well as the services they could provide. I do think, again, those materials were given out, and so I'm welcome to revisit as we get more concrete information from Gray City Schools as to what that longer, yeah. bigger contract might look like. And I think to your point, Mr. Gregg, were you finished? I mean, to interrupt you. Yeah. I think we could, um, when we get to that part of the agenda where we're discussing the treasurer's report, it may be a great chance to talk about this a little bit more because I want to make sure everybody feels like they have a chance to ask any question they want before they're asked to vote on an item tonight. So we can certainly come back to that as we keep going. Um, is there anything anybody wants on this point now on the priorities and where we're doing that folks want to mention before we move on? I just don't see how we can vote tonight. Uh, I think that that may or may not be something everybody agrees with, um, and I think we should talk about it. Great. Um, Dr. Moffitt. Well, I just want to say, absolutely love my colleagues. Um, we, ha we have had an extended period of time in this space regarding the RFP mm -hmm. from Mike and Brandon. Mm -hmm. So that was the time to get the questions out to make sure that you were clear on what was the, what were the expectations and add anything to that that needed to be done so if i do think we're ready to vote but if we do happen to delay this any then we have to also be committed not to, to just doing the work and putting it here so the public can see it but also about doing the background work so that we are prepared to vote timely and we don't have to keep just continuing this discussion so that we can add extra things on it okay so uh, to be continued, even in this meeting, probably in about 35 to 37 minutes from now. Um, so thanks, everybody, for our board update. Um, we're going to keep moving to hearing of the public.
Uh, and so each speaker here will have two minutes and will direct all comments to the presiding officer. Once a request to speak has been granted, you will be invited to enter. Um, please click on the camera icon to go interactive. Provide your name, your affiliation to the district, your school community, your topic, and your contact information if you'd like a direct response to any questions you might have. This request is consistent with board protocol and we appreciate your help. In the unusual event that someone is not willing to follow this protocol, we do reserve the right to end that speaker's time. Again, each speaker will have two minutes to speak. When the timer goes off, your time is up. Please refrain from discussing any personnel issues. After speaking, you will briefly see the welcome screen again as you transition back to the live stream meeting. Finally, we ask that your public commentary be respectful of all listeners. Thank you. Uh, we likely this evening have a mix of some speakers who are here in person and some speakers online. We're gonna start with the folks who are in person. We have three. Uh, they will be um, Ruth DeBono, followed by Bella Gord, followed by Ryan Shearer. If we could have all the speakers come down now, um, that way we can go uh, right from one to the next. We'll appreciate it. Um, thank you, Ms. DeBono. Hi, um, my name is Ruth DeBono. I'm a senior at Walnut Hills High School, and I'm here today with the Young Activist Coalition. We're here to discuss school discipline in Cincinnati Public Schools. Currently, our schools use punitive discipline, which pun punishes the offender rather than healing those affected by any actions that may take place in schools. Schools are meant to be a place, safe place where students can learn and grow and develop and learn from all of their mistakes. But when students are pulled out of class or referred to school police for normal childhood behavior, it stifles their growth in this regard and, it, and makes it difficult for them to learn from their mistakes. Restorative and transformative justice are evidence-based alternatives to punitive discipline that have been successfully implemented in multiple school districts. Um, just one example is the Oakland City School District in California. Punitive discipline has been shown in, in general and specifically in CPS to disproportionately affect black, brown, and other marginalized groups of students. In order to successfully implement restorative and transformative justice, we have to create an environment that encourages community and conversation and doesn't simply punish students for the things that they do in schools that are most likely just normal childhood behaviors that you know kids do all the time. Additionally, restorative and transformative justice cannot be successfully implemented with school police officers in schools Police in schools criminalize our students, make, um, make students feel less safe in schools in many cases, and are a large part of the school to prison pipeline, which again, disproportionately affects um, black, brown, and other marginalized groups of students and harms students going into their future and involves them in you know, the criminal justice system and that stuff um, unnecessarily, and it can be really harmful for our students. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. DeBono. Next, we have Ms. Gordon. If I'm pronouncing your last name incorrectly, please. Uh, make sure I'm right. It's Bella Gordo. Gordo, great. Thanks, Ms. Gordo. Hi, it's good to see you guys in person. Um, I'm here as president of the Young Actress Coalition, um, and we're fighting for police removal from schools and the implementation of restorative justice practices. If you're not familiar with restorative justice, which I'm sure you're all at, at this point, restorative justice seeks to correct and repair the harm created by misbehavior through communication, trust, and understanding. As a student, I hope that the board replaces our current harmful system of punitive justice that has not been found to decrease rates of misbehavior with a system of restorative justice that has been found to be effective. The key difference between these two practices is that one simply punishes the students for misbehavior, while the other shows students the harm that their action created and how to best resolve it with all involved parties. In addition, restorative justice is not compatible with school police. We're placing schools to resolve conflict through arrest, restraint, court referral, and or other general presence. They also reflect the punitive carceral system that is in direct conflict with restorative justice and the hope and aims of schools. If CPS were to implement restorative justice, it would be in line with districts across the country, such as Chicago, New York City, Buffalo, Oakland, and Milwaukee. That practice restorative justice in their schools with great success. No student in this district should feel as though they're unworthy of healing or the support of their school community. Thank you for your time, and I hope that the board will take action to implement these policies swiftly. Thank you, Ms. Gordo. We're now going to hear from Mr. Shearer. Good evening. 
Uh, my name is Ryan Shear. I teach seventh and eighth grade social studies at uh, the Academy of World Languages. Um, in addition, I'm also the co-facilitator for the teacher leadership program, which is an AFT and CFT program. Uh, we have teachers that apply to get into this program, and once they get in, they do they commit to a one Saturday a month for the nine months of the school year, and they conduct an action research project on whatever topic they feel connected to in education. Uh, and typically they end up working with another uh, cohort member if they have similar interests. So we are at the end, close to the end of our program. In May, we have our teacher leadership showcase where all of our teachers and will present their projects that they have done. And these projects are not just, you know, based off of their opinions. They, they part of the research is data collection we send out surveys throughout the whole district and try to collect data on whatever the topic may be. Um, some of these topics that we are covered this year are school safety, anti-racist policy, and teacher recruitment and retention of teachers of color, advanced placement, student recruitment, and professional development with that, equity and inclusion through mentorship and employment, equity in elementary education, and teacher planning and preparation time. So, in short, I'm here to invite you to our showcase because we, we feel that these topics, some of them are district level, some are state level, some are federal level, mostly district and state level, where we feel that part of the, part of the program and part of the research is that they do have to put together some, some, some possible solutions or what they feel might be a pathway towards solutions, some of the data that they've seen. So I would like to invite all of you to the showcase. It's May 4th at the Academy of World Languages. You don't need to write it down. I got a flyer right here for all of you. Uh, but it's five to seven at the Academy of World Languages. About 10 presentations, about 10 minutes each. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Shearer, very much. And for our online speakers, we're gonna hear from Mr. Hoing. Yeah, we have two speakers this evening. Our first speaker, Jason Munzel, followed by CFT President Julie Sellers. Go ahead, Mr. Munzel. Hi, hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Jason Munzel, and I currently attend McNicholas High School. I'm a concerned community member and friend of many Cincinnati public students. I'm also here with Young Activist Coalition to support our goal of building restorative justice and removing SROs from CPS. It's important to create a comfortable and safe place for all students which SROs do the opposite of. We should not have police inside our schools because it builds the school to prison pipeline instead of setting students up for success. As I said, I currently attend McNicholas, which is a private school in Mount Washington, and we don't have any police presence in our schools. I feel safer because of this. I know my friends and classmates aren't gonna be bothered by cops while at school. We're there to learn and, and grow as people and build relationships. And we shouldn't have to worry about the possibility of disciplinary, disciplinary action from police. I know each school community is different, but none of those differences should require police inside of schools. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you, our last speaker is CFT President Julie Sellers. Go ahead, Ms. Sellers. Thank you so much. Um, I am so glad that Ryan was there to invite you to the teacher leadership program and give you an idea of the topics but I wanna give you a little bit more background on this program that we've been doing for many years. It's, it's a program that started out of New York City during the early reform movement when they were having um, reforms with no teachers or people who work with students front line um, involved with any of those processes. Our teachers uh, meet for a full day once a month for nine months and they complete an action research project throughout that time. They work with um, similar groups, but they, it's all data driven and it is um, a true action research project. And so they put in a lot of time researching ideas for our district and it really would be appreciated if you could make the time for a couple of hours to come and listen to the teachers and the research that they have come up with. Many of the topics are topics that you all discuss on a regular basis. Um, the second thing that I would like to talk about is the transportation RFP. Um, I hope that we can get that right because it has negatively impacted student learning across our district. 
and CFT will, will be more than happy to do any type of leverage that you need. We will go to meetings. We will meet with the public. We will meet with students. We will do whatever is necessary so that our kids can get to school and they're not negatively impacted on um, their graduations because of transportation. As I have been saying for since this um, fiasco started last summer, that the hardest part of a student's day should not be them figuring out how they're going to get to school. Um, the next thing I would like to talk about, because I do follow what's going on with the state, is House Bill 161. And I hope that the board will pass a resolution against this unjust bill that violates CPS's core values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, no teacher, um, in the bill, it says that no teacher shall receive continuing education credit or other credit required for licensure, renewal, for any semester or other program that teaches, promotes, or endorses um, diversity or inherently racist concepts. While CFT members largely engage in professional development and continuing ed courses focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this bill would be very negatively impacting all of the teachers in this district, not just the students, but also the teachers. And so we will do anything to help the board, and we hope the board supports us when we start um, reaching out to legislators to um, stop this bill from passing. And the last thing that I want to talk about is um, a couple meetings ago, the board voted on the calendar, and it's for the 22-23 school year. And somehow from the calendar committee to what you voted on, the calendar dates changed. And um, I, there are too many days within the, um, the calendar. We need to go back, and we need to look at that. And secondly, besides the number of days, because remember, Teachers only have a 191-day contract. I think we're different than almost all of the other work groups, but we those that's the that's the most that we're allowed to work given our contracts. Um, but on January 2nd, um, that is really the um, holiday that everyone is supposed to be following because January 1st is on a Sunday. So when a holiday is on a Sunday. It's recognized nationally on the Monday. So that would mean on December the 25th, which is a holiday within our contract, we should be off then on the Monday, which we are. But then the January 1st is on a Sunday and somehow the calendar has us going back to school on January 2nd, which is really the recognized holiday. So I'm not sure how we bring this back to the board but it has to come back to the board and it has to be revoted on because it's incorrect and it's not within the guidelines of our contract or any of the other unions contracts. So I'm not sure who could get with me to make sure that we could get this corrected now before people start making plans for their future. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Sellers. Uh, is that our, and that's our last speaker, Dan? Okay, um, thank you all very much. We're gonna move um, next into our approval of minutes. Uh, I need a motion to approve the minutes from special meeting March 21, business meeting March 21. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Morosky. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Moffat. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The minutes are approved as presented. We're going to move next to our section on committee reports where we have four. Um, we're going to start with a report from the audit committee from Ms. Bolton. Thank you very much. Uh, from our community audit committee, uh, reporting these minutes, uh, Kevin Vaughn, from Plattenberg and Associates reported that they have audited the financial statements of the governmental activities. Each major fund and aggregate remaining fund information of the Cincinnati City School District for the year ending in June 21, and they are happy to report, and we are proud to announce that it was a clean 
audit for the district and that uh, shows well on our staff, both financially and also in all administrative activities. Uh, the audit committee also uh, was informed and required to sign a conflict of interest at work uh, for uh, the, their members and have done so. There was an additional and ever continuing report regarding the benefits uh, committee update as uh, we try to find ways to improve what it is that we do regarding benefits. Hopefully we're getting close to the end of that report uh, and we'll see how that works out. Also, there was an audit status report. Uh, the Chief Audit Executive Roberts provided an update regarding the status of the following internal audit projects. I won't repeat all of them, but it's part of her plan. For the year, there are nine different projects that were reported on. Those appear in your minutes. And then also, uh, the, uh, Ms. Roberts also re reported to uh, the audit committee the results of her efforts as requested by the policy committee uh, regarding the auditing of uh, board policies on equity and excellence, anti-racism, parent and family engagement, and purchasing of goods and services. Also, there is a long list of audits that are in progress. So anybody that thinks that we're not being transparent or that people aren't looking into everything we're doing financially, the Ohio Department of Ed has, a, has an audit uh, and it has a number of bullets under it. The Ohio Auditor of State, the Ohio Department of Ed again, uh, all those are in the process or have been completed. Uh, also in the audit status report, there is an audit being done regarding accounts payable, uh, also regarding procurement card follow-ups and financial updates uh, as you will appear and see in any of the monthly finance uh, reports uh, from the finance uh, uh, board budget as well, budget committee as well. And then also Ms. Roberts reported that the audit committee training is going to be taking place on April 27th. Uh, for audit committee members. I submit and hope for approval. And thank again our fantastic community audit committee full of experts. Thank you, Board Member Bolton. Do folks have any questions for uh, Ms. Bolton about the audit committee? Okay, hearing none, we're going to move to the report from the Policy and Equity Committee from Mr. Morosky. Thank you. Uh, Policy and Equity met on March 18th in this room at 9 a.m. Um, that committee is myself, Ms. Bolton, and Dr. Moffitt. Uh, we talked about uh, a whole lot of items, and I'll get through them as quickly as possible. Some we've already discussed with this body, so they're no longer germane. Um, first, we discussed our implementation of Policy 2255 and how well or not well we are doing. Um, and Policy 2256, those are equity and excellence in education policy and anti-racism policy. Um, when President Lindy was on the committee, he suggested that we do an audit of sorts of some key policies, and these were two of them. Um, by and large, uh, the, the report, I think, would probably be like a yellow or an orange, I would say, to use the parlance of the day. Um, I think that's fair. I think it's fair where there's things happening now that were not happening before the passage of 2256 um, regarding anti-bias, implicit bias training, things like this. Um, and so all of those are available in the minutes to see. Um, Dr. Moffitt brought up, uh, and, and she was right to do so, I believe, that with the anti-racism policy, we are talking very explicitly about the uh, disparate outcomes for black and white students. Hard stop. Uh, we have our equity policy, you know, obviously is all encompassing of a, a lot of different groups, uh, minority groups, and to use um, dated terminology in education subgroups. And anti-racism, we were talking about black and white. In no system in America does anyone underperform black or outperform white, and that is a very deliberate thing that we want to dismantle. And so I wanted to highlight that that was brought up. Um, our action was we advised administration to do a presentation about the DEI work plan <clears throat> and how we are going to measure that through a metric called DARE, not like the, the drug thing, it's a different one. So we will have a presentation in this body about, about that coming up. Next, um, board bylaws, public participation at board meetings. Uh, Mr. Hoying, our general counsel, updated our committee um, regarding revisions, hearing of the public, signing up to speak, et cetera, students speaking. Um, we have uh, already discussed this and approved uh, the revised policy. 
vaccine requirements for employees. Uh, we have discussed this in this body as well, but as a reminder, we are not asking for weekly testing for folks who are opting out of the vaccination, um, uh, nor are we for new employees. However, if you are opting out of the vaccination, uh, you'll be put on you know, the list of the opt-outs, and if there becomes a situation where COVID is peaking again and we need to go back to that uh, old policy, we will at that time, but for now, Thankfully, um, things are looking good. <clears throat> we approved an alcohol waiver for the Cincinnati Chamber Orchestra, um, who we know can be unruly at times. That was a joke. Um, we passed Juneteenth as a holiday at the last uh, board meeting. These are dated minutes. Uh, the calendar uh, was in the policy um, in, in the policy committee and. Um, uh, previously had been in Student Achievement Committee and uh, came to policy. We heard some information tonight that I found interesting, so I don't know uh, what administration will want to do regarding that or if we want to take it back up if the calendar did change. I don't know. It's the first I heard of this. Either way, um, uh, action for that, we're going to do an additional review of calendars at April 15th meeting, which is this Friday. Lastly, um, uh, we asked for approval of our committee work plan. Um, when you when you pass these minutes, um, our work plan will be passed. Uh, essentially, we are continuing with our yearly audit of existing policies. And uh, a couple years ago, uh, Ms. Bolton was on a committee with myself, and it was Mr. Lindy, and we had a long discussion about policies that are sort of administrative work and policies that are board work. And within those policies under board work, which ones are more philosophical in nature and which ones are more about the work? Um, and we're going to take a deep dive into those policies that we, you know, think govern our work and the, the things that we can control and, and try to, to use president's uh, language, you know, hold ourselves accountable to what we say we're going to do. So I think that'll be a good use of our time and committee. And then attendance boundary lines. You've heard us talk about this a lot out of policy committee. Um, and this one, uh, I will end on this one and it will probably include discussion at some point. Uh, as we look at the attendance boundary lines for our schools, um, it was, uh, I think, in the committee's uh, opinion, certainly in mine, speaking for myself, uh, and, I, and I know Ms. Bolton, but I believe in, with Dr. Moffitt as well, that there was, a, there was an amenability to looking at these boundary lines. Do they continue to make sense? Um, um, do they need to be affected? Uh, the recommendation from the committee uh, was that an ad hoc committee of board members be created to address and discuss school attendance boundary lines. Um, our president, Mr. Lindy, was in attendance at the meeting, um, and at that meeting, he recommended that administration look at this instead of creating an ad hoc committee. I only bring that up because, again, I think there probably warrants some kind of discussion at some point, either tonight or in the future. I present the minute. Oh, one more transportation policy review. We've been doing this for a long time. There's three major policies um, that sort of impact our, uh, our work as a district. Um, we have presented um, those uh, to this body. They've been approved to move forward, but I just wanted to highlight that to the minutes. I present the meetings as written. Thank you, Mr. Moraski. Uh, any questions or discussion? Uh, Ms. Jones. Yes. Um, what I'm about to say really does, is very well related to what Ms. Sellers was saying about the calendar. And I also had this conversation with um, very briefly with Mr. Moroski and in more detail with Ms. Bolton. Um, I, I, I understand fully that there are occasions when there's overlap across the committees regarding the work. But policy operates very differently than the other committees. And as I understand it, the, the task of policy, the, the, the work that policy gets really comes from as it comes as a result of the direction of the board. And, you know, and I'm looking at the tasks that um, the responsibilities of the, the policy committee, yet in the minutes, um, this whole deal about the two year school calendars, I learned prior to the SAC meeting that it had been, I learned through their minutes that it, it was addressed. And so the issues that Ms. Sellers was speaking to I became aware of in my conversation with Ms. Bolton and in review of the uh, draft of the calendars. And I, I have asked Ms. Bolton 
um, I asked Ms. Bolton um, about the rationale for having it in policy committee. It just didn't seem like a good fit. So when you use the term philosophy versus the work, I understand that policy is involved in the work of reviewing the policy, establishing the policy, and what have you. But the philosophy of the work and the strategic focus of the work should lie in across all the other committees. And so I did ask Ms. Bolton to allow the, the Student Achievement Committee to do the work of the calendars where it has been for many years, as I understand, so I don't know how it ended up in policy committee. Um, I also, there are um, other uh, subject areas which I have concerns about in, in terms of what uh, Mr. Morosky is saying, philosophy versus the work in the strategic focus and the nature of the work. And, and another example of that is the boundary lines for the schools. Yes, we do have, we have a policy that addresses enrollment and, and all of that. But my last recollection was that the topic itself lies with the growth committee. So I don't know where the switches come. I'm having a hard time following the fact that policy committee is taking on more of the strategic planning and work of these areas and and rather than and I didn't want to bring it up I, I only brought it up because I don't intend to vote yes in accepting the policy minutes because I disagree fundamentally with some of the work that's being done and I need the opportunity to ask questions um, and really look at uh, uh, the work that SAC is doing that that really overlaps with them and so um, we just had our meeting on Friday. We don't have our minutes there, but uh, had a conversation with Mr. McDowell, who I asked to present, and it looks like he's having to present twice, and I don't understand that. And so if, if Ms. Bolton, I asked you if you were okay with, um, and you said yes, okay with just letting SAC do the work on that, but it sounds like we have some work to do, and I did say to Mr. McDowell, that we needed to have time because we didn't have time to really take a look at it. So these are the things that you shared with me that were concerns. I would only ask that topics like that, um, if they fundamentally belong in a different committee, then they should go. That it, you know, so that that's kind of where I am. Ask a clarifying question, that um, yeah. Ms. Jones. Each committee has a work plan, right? So, so should, I was trying to answer for myself, how would I resolve this question about like, what should the committee's scope be? Yeah. You know, as I understand it, the work plan should address that, right? And it, if, it and does, if it's, and it does in a very broad sense, it does, it does. But if you look at the content, I mean, it's really planning that's going on in these things. And, you know, gotcha. but like I said, there's also a lot of overlap. And yeah. I understand that, but we can't justify it. You know, I, I don't want us to justify that all of this overlap, we're, we're doing two strategic sort of paths around this. So, yeah, I hope that answers your question. It does, yeah, okay. thank you very much. Ms. Bolton. Yeah, I'm happy to answer, and I, I thought part of our conversation took care of some of this, but um, happy to share it publicly, if it's okay with the chair of policy. Uh, the reason that the, um, school calendar was brought to policy came indirectly as a result of the policy committee was responsible for reviewing and then recommending whether or not we would have Juneteenth. So the issue of calendar came in a month and then as a, as an, a question to um, the folks that presented Juneteenth, I asked about the school calendar for the year because in the last year and maybe the last two years, Student Achievement Committee had not uh, discussed or recommended or reviewed student achievement, uh, reviewed the calendar. So if they were going to do it or not do it, the calendar needed to come forward because we'd gone a year without notifying the public what the calendar was. The calendar committee, by the way, is a committee between the administration and CFT negotiating our school year. And it has to be approved by the superintendent. It has to be approved by uh, the board. Um, and so 
the fact that it had not been in the proper committee and it should be in student achievement. The fact that it came before us in policy was directly as a result of asking questions about uh, as a follow-up to Juneteenth. So that's how it got there. Nobody changed anybody's work plan. Nobody was fooling around or having mission creep or anything. But when that was raised, then indeed the administration properly came back with the proposal for the next two years so that we wouldn't be so delayed as we had been for the, the, the coming year. Uh, so I think that's part of it. And I think the, the issue of boundaries, so we've been working on that. Uh, it, it, it was once in student achievement, but it's no longer in the work plan for student achievement. And that's several years ago when it was, when we made some recommendations as we were forming uh, our school CANS school, the Clifton area neighborhood school, because we had determined as a board to make that strictly a neighborhood school, in part uh, with the advice, if you will, of, of uh, Ms. Sellers, who had made it very clear that the north central part of the, the district was under uh, represented and had, and we also had the issue of uh, Fairview across the street from the old Clifton school. So that's where it used to be. The reason that it's now in policy is because enrollment, and there are at least three, perhaps five, enrollment policies that pertain to uh, um, uh, boundary lines and who and, the, and, and how enrollment occurs, whether it's magnet or neighborhood. So that's why it's in policy and that fits within the work plan. Um, and the, the other piece of that enrollment uh, is uh, the question was raised and asked of general counsel who is responsible for drawing those lines, who is responsible for boundary lines, and it is the board. Uh, it is not the administration. And then the, then the legal counsel also presented to us that at least at that time when we had the committee meeting, that uh, the boundary lines had not been redrawn in a recent time post FMP, but it's since in a personal conversation, I believe the treasurer has said that somewhere during the FMP process, uh, she was involved with redrawing the lines, but I don't even think the general counsel was aware of that. And redrawing lines or drawing lines and enrollment is impacting on something as a finance chair, I should say, wait a minute, policy, don't do that because these boundary lines and, uh, are, and enrollment are impacting our uh, transportation issues. So there is this overlap, as you would imagine, on big, big things like a calendar or transportation, but the enrollment is the, the policies are the reason it's there. And that's why finance has to share some responsibility with policy regarding transportation because policy writes those poli policy writes the policies. And the transportation policy was, uh, I think, originated either in 1942 or 1948. There are 350 policies, and the vast majority of them really only impact whether or not our administration is implementing. And so what we did last year was divide those big issues to try to keep us thinking big. But with the bigger you're thinking, probably the most overlap you'll see when it's a very minute or specific thing. So I think that uh, I, I, I'm sure that the sure that the committee on policy is not unhappy to send back student uh, the, uh, the the year's calendar back to student achievement. But it was not it was an encroachment that came as an indirect based upon us having to pass and advise on Juneteenth. But I think one of the interesting things that was raised in policy is that it was presented two years of a calendar, and one of those years would be outside the CFT uh, contract, which is, I don't know, that the board will have to decide if it wants to see that negotiations position uh, by passing a calendar that's outside the CFT contracts, and it's the CFT and the administration that creates the calendar for our purview and hopefully agreement. So let me, go ahead, then I yeah, have a thought. I, just a couple brief comments. Um, the way that I am, and I appreciate Ms. Bolton's comments, and I accept that she agrees that it should go, uh, pop, that this should, the calendar should be in SAC. I, you know, I believe firmly that the policies are driven by the work. The policies, the review of policies, the rescission of policies, all of that is driven by the work. But when you read the minutes, 
it looks like the policy committee is getting into the work. Now, I could be wrong, and I hear you saying there's a lot of overlap. The last time that, that I recall about the, the um, boundary lines, that was directed to the Finance Growth Committee. And I, re I, rem yeah, I remember that conversation here in the board meeting because you were pushing it mm -hmm. and Ms. Bates was pushing it. Absolutely. And the board agreed to that. So, I, and I don't know if it's still in finance, I don't know if it's still in finance or growth, but it looks like in the minutes that you all are basically, because you're looking at the maps, you're looking, to me, right. that is sort of preliminary to um, uh, making policy decisions, not that it's not important. So I'm saying all of that to say that maybe what we need to do is just agree that we have to talk to each other. These committees need to talk to each other about the work because the other piece of this, and then I'll be quiet, I don't think it's fair to ask staff to come in consecutive weeks to talk about the same thing. It just doesn't make sense. And so you're going to have another meeting on Friday, and, and I mentioned to Mr. McDowell, he has to do what he has to do. If he was asked, then I guess he's supposed to be there, but it doesn't make sense. And then you all are giving him direction on how to address the calendar as well as student achievement. And so I, I just don't think we want to duplicate the work. So I'll, I've said enough on that. But yeah. I, was, the, 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 I appreciate that, Ms. Jones. The thing I was just going to offer, and then we'll go to Mr. Morosky, I promise, um, is I think with, with an eye towards the complexity of the issue and the other things we also need to talk about this evening, if there are any areas where committee chairs feel like there's still either an absence of clarity or real disagreement about what should or shouldn't be within scope for different committees, I think we should have a meeting about it. Okay, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy to. I actually had considered just putting it on the agenda for another meeting, not today's okay. meeting. Yeah, so. Or, or even um, I'm, I'm happy to sit down with the two committee chairs, you know, and we can, and we can put our heads together and figure that out. Yeah. Mr. Morosky. I was just going to say, um, as chair of the policy committee, so first of all, I, I, you, you're not going to get me to fight to keep the school calendar in our committee. So if you want it, you can you have it. it. I don't care. Um, like it came there as-, as Well, don't make it sound so unimportant. Yeah, no. No, 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 no. It is, no. It is important. it's important. It's very it's, important. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, I do think there was, you know, there were a number of issues that created a perfect storm uh, of it coming to the committee. And yeah, it's fine if it didn't stack. I don't particularly care where it is as long as it gets done. It makes sense to me, quite frankly, why it came to policy, but it doesn't need to be there. But it didn't come to policy. Policy mm -hmm. took it. Well, it, it came to us and organic. It, and I talked to the previous SAC person, uh, chair, who gave me good insight into what they had done. Now, maybe, maybe people didn't like it or didn't agree with the calendar or whatever, but still the first step in that process is to clarify with the committee where it belongs. For that, that, that's, yeah. Yeah, totally. So that, that's fine with me. Um, I, I don't mind that at all. I, I, I do want to uh, speak a little bit to the boundary lines, which I do believe belongs in policy. Um, the reason I shook my head when you were talking about finance and growth is it actually began in Student Achievement Committee in my very first year on this board five years ago. Um, and this conversation has been going on for a long time. It has actually made the rounds in every single committee except, I guess at this point, health and safety. Um, which I think it. speaks to how important it is. We don't want it. We don't want it. No, Let's you know. Clear. Um, and, and with all due respect, you know, this this issue of these boundary lines has been in all of our committee minutes. This is not new, and this is not like should not be news to anybody. We've been talking about this. Um, but secondly, I would just like to highlight the minutes again that the reason the ad hoc committee was suggested was because of this conversation. And we tried to head this off by suggesting it. Now again, President Lindy had his own opinions. The law would seem to dictate that we make that decision, however. The only other piece I would add in defense, um, I don't know if that's even the right word, I don't think it's the right word, but in for the boundary lines being in policy is that all of these issues, specialized union enrollment, students of CPS employees, West Side and East Side, I'm not gonna go through them, they're all in the minutes, um, are policies of the district explicitly and, 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 and who partakes and how they partake in these, this laundry list of offerings we have, because we are so unique, um, comes down to quite frankly, how the lines are. So I, to me, there's nothing more 
substantial to what we offer then those lines what we offer all resides in policy as far as who gets in i really not speaking broadly um, but again that's why at the end of that conversation it was suggested by all of us that this become an ad hoc committee of board members because it was not something it's a, at your point that we shouldn't be getting down in and doing the, the work of in that committee that the philosophy of it I think is ours but I, I don't I agree that I don't think the work is which is why the recommendation I just wanted to highlight that part so th thank you Mr. Brasky I do want to try to move us forward here I think the one thing I want to just flag for everybody is is I want to try to push as hard as I can to create a, a, a firewall if you will between management and governance for us as a board and for committees and and as I understand the the division you know, our job as a board or as committees is to get clear on what the outcomes are that we're going to hold the administration accountable for. And the administration figures out what is the best way for us to get there. It's their call. Uh, and then we're holding them accountable to make sure that those outcomes uh, actually happen. Um, so I just, as, as in terms of what are the different tools we use to decide what should or shouldn't be in scope, what should be with one committee or a different committee, what should be with the administration versus with a committee, I think the line I want to keep really pushing on is our job is governance, administration's role is management, uh, and everything is going to be better for kids and families. The clearer I think we can get on that. Uh, if this is a last comment in less than a minute, is that will that work, Ms. Bolden? Yeah, I think you've expanded the issue from from uh, issues among the committees as to who's doing what to <laughs> what we are supposedly hiring the. Uh, great city schools people to help us learn about what go governance is. I'm just going to tell you as a 15-year veteran where there's a firewall between administration and the board, we have issues like transportation, which we have failed. And again, I thank the new administration for listening more attentively and being much more aggressive about trying to get the will of the community and the will of the board enacted into administration for transportation. But I look forward to us having this bigger discussion about governance, but I think we've resolved the issue, not resolved, but at least we're going to have a talk about who's doing what among mm -hmm. committees. But I will also say, if we really keep the board in the governance role, you're going to see policy increase in its importance instead of being an afterthought like I, it was 10 years ago. And if you're talking in terms, last comment, if you're talking in terms of transportation as finance chair, I just as soon not have to go back to policy, but when you look at the three policies that the administration and the board have, have uh, uh, adopted, and, and two of them three have adopted, uh, the reality is that's where we should be working is in policy. And it's, it's mind-bending the difference between these new policies and transportation versus the ones dating back to 1940-something or other. So it's all good work, but I think we should have a conversation among the chairs or whoever or, or what have you. So I think this has been useful. It, it's a so good topic we, for the gov for the um, discussion that we have about governance. Mm -hmm. I really do yeah. believe that. Yeah. And, and so as as, uh, as hard as it may be to see, that is two of the four committee reports that we have this evening. So we're going to move to the Budget, Finance, and Growth Committee. I might ask if Ms. Bolton could present the report from the committee in two or three minutes. Probably and not. So uh, I will do it as quickly as I can. I've even highlighted tonight. So Highlights you all sound great. Me. Yes, but of course, like many teenagers, I've highlighted everything, but I'll, I'll skip over. Um, at any rate, uh, the uh, report of the Budget, Finance, and Growth Committee, speaking of growth, uh, Madam Vice President, the, we have been, the administration told us that finances are on track with no significant or unexpected issues. Uh, we've had the report uh, that we have a number of uh, grants we have uh, that are part of our revenue, and, and they're on 18th month uh, cycle, I think. Uh, there's public grants, there's 34 of those, and there are eight that are non-public, and there are, uh, excuse me, there are eight that are COVID-related, and there are nine, and we've gone through almost 60% of the grants, which is actually pretty good. ESSER will continue to give us revenue uh, f uh, through uh, uh, 2024. We have community reinvestment agreements that are posted in the minutes for us. The most important thing that uh, came up, uh, I would say, is the need, and we've already mentioned it uh, briefly, and that is the need to create a, a new contract uh, with SORTA. 
and that the new, that was recommended that the new contract be done in light of our current circumstances, as well as importantly enough, based upon new transportation policies, and also probably the need to, for a sorted contract has to uh, also uh, somehow be kind of publicly shared and communicated in those negotiations between SORTA uh, and uh, the school district, and hopefully with some sort of uh, guidance and involvement and, and pressure, if you will, uh, from city council and the county commission, which appoints the SORTA board, because it's a SORTA board that has responsibility for the contract, just like it is the board, school board that has responsibility uh, for the contract for the district. So that's an important thing that has to be happening very soon, uh, SORTA is pushing to have those negotiations begin very quickly. And uh, our issue was that we don't want to do it, uh, negotiate until we actually have a wonderful proposal uh, from our administration. Um, also, it was reported uh, that uh, a number of our school, dis of school districts are being penalized, as we had reported here uh, last month and, and about three months before that. Uh, because the state law from the state legislature that doesn't really care very much for urban school districts uh, informed uh, everyone that uh, charter schools and other non-public schools don't have to inform us of those sorts of things that uh, we need to know in order to schedule our routes. Uh, and it is costing us uh, some millions of dollars that's been reduced somewhat. Uh, and also as an update, the Columbus City is suing and went into court to try to get this changed and they had some preliminary success in a court case that we were not a part of, but it does hopefully impact us. And then finally, uh, trying to get through this, we had an absolutely stunning uh, presentation, uh, not only about the budget, but uh, the idea of a real massive review of our ESSER funds uh, because things have so radically changed and we may need to defer or repurpose and that is taking place. Also, uh, the idea of engagement uh, uh, efforts for, with our public uh, to influence the, uh, the budget uh, outcomes, if you will. Uh, and then also, uh, we talked again about levy options, and we'll be coming back uh, next meeting and asking, uh, recommending a particular way of doing this levy. We would rather do that prior to the, the uh, arrival of our incoming superintendent. So the first thing she's asking of the, com of the community is not a levy, uh, but indeed we'll, we'll let the uh, uh, outgoing superintendent take, share that burden uh, with the community, but it is important and we will have a recommendation. Uh, and then also we have two committees um, as well, the tax incentive review committee that we need assignments for and appointments. We'll be coming back to get those appointments the next time. And then also it's been suggested too that there is a tax abatement ad hoc committee that the uh, treasurer has worked with some members of city council and the uh, finance committee will be serving on that as well. And then we had one public comment. The public comment was to uh, request that in the new levy uh, that we have, not new levy, but the renewal levy that we have be a 10 year levy, not a continuing levy because in the last 15 years, the only levy that has failed has been um, one of those that is a uh, continuing levy. So I submit and hope for uh, approval. Your addendums, I think very importantly, are levy options, the CRAs, description of the uh, grants, but also uh, for the first time, you know, at least this year I know of, we have a listing of the capital improvement projects with pictures, diagrams, and what have you which has not been the recent practice, but when we were living through the FMP where we went through 60 some schools, uh, we would see those sorts of uh, stages of the facilities efforts, not towards the very end, but throughout. So I think that's something as we, as we look at some more capital and that re referred to Hyde Park, Walnut Hills and um, PRM. I submit, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bolton. Any questions on the finance, budget finance and growth committee report? Moving on, uh, our chair is not here for health and safety, but is there another member of that committee who would like to share a report from that meeting? I last will month? do that and I will be very brief. I'm gonna try my hardest to be two to three, well, three minutes. I'm a little long-winded, so 
And I think uh, Board Member Bolton took five minutes, so I might take four. Anyway, so um, <clears throat> Board Member Weinberg is not here. She's the chair, and I'll go through just a little bit of this. We had a presentation, a really, really good presentation by Cincinnati Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. We did recommend that they come and give a presentation to the board. They have a SMART program um, that will help parents and adults prevent child gun deaths and injuries. They are asking, um, recommending and asking for a resolution from boards across the nation, not just here in Ohio, but specifically us. Um, and so we recommended that they come and give us a presentation so that you all can see what we saw and learn more about the SMART program. We also got a report from our um, government liaison, Mr. Kearney, and um, he talked about bills that are coming up. And at that time, because we didn't have, we haven't had a meeting since March 21st, it's been a while. At that time, we didn't have movement on some pretty critical things that are now coming up that I think everybody is pretty much aware of, House Bill 616, um, which is the sneaky, uh, don't say gay bill, but that Florida just went through. Um, but we, he talked to us about, so we, we will have to get an update with him on that. But we talked about the voucher program, um, the critical race theory bill, House Bill 327 at that time, uh, which is what we were pretty much worried about. We did talk about um, K through 12 mental health concerns and some things that are coming up at the state level regarding that. He informed the committee about um, 327, 497, um, which eliminates student retention under the third grade reading guarantee. He talked about 582 and the amendments of all of that. Um, the public can go look at this committee report. I, I hate to read stuff to people that they can get, but go look at the committee report because it's all down here too. But I'm just gonna give you a bird's eye view. Um, he talked about five, Bill, House Bill 583 which was to, in, to issue substitute educator licenses for uh, the need for substitutes that we've recently had. Then, then we had a really good presentation by our Director of Safety and Security, Mr. Bell, and he talked about, he gave some really good kudos to some staff members that had done some really extraordinary things for the month of March. <clears throat> Go back and read that report and look at that data because it's all there. Uh, let's see, go back. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. We had a kick rock, kick, kick self presentation from Jessica Shelley, Director of Food Services, about the USDA requirements for the food that we've got in our buildings and how it is really, really good. They've got a new salsa provider. So um, you guys should check that out. Good food is coming. Good food is coming. So we did talk about that. We had, we had Jessica come and, and give us some uh, data on that. Then we talked about student conduct and discipline, and we know we have some work to do. Assistant Superintendent Bundy gave us a really good report. We all recognize we got some work to do, and we're working on it. That's the cool thing about it is that we're really, really working on it. And so go and read that report in the committee report because you are going to be completely um, shocked about that too and the work that, we're, that the staff is doing. And I think the last thing, oh wait, Ms. Solano reported uh, the update, the pedestrian safety at the schools. We had a great report on that. Got some movement around improving the safety in our buildings. The city has been calling Ms. Solano back and working with her finally. And we are kicking tail with the safety of schools and the pedestrian safety. So we got a list of stuff that um, is on her list of things to do. Vision Zero Advisory Committee gave us um, a, a small update. We're going to hear a little bit about that later on. Um, we had a hearing of the public, and um, I think that's I think that's pretty much it. But for those that need it a little bit slower, go to the uh, Cincinnati Public website, get our Health and Safety Committee report because we've got a lot of great addendums that I can't show you here, but there's some charts in here. The SMART program is defined, the USDA meal requirements and what they're doing with the, the money that they're receiving for food. And they're even, they're even talking about having a program where the kids can grow their food because we've got agriculture programs in our schools and they can eat it. So I'm telling you, you guys missed a great presentation because it was, it was doing really good. So check that out. And I think that's it. What's that about four minutes? 
It was great, Dr. Malcolm. Hopefully a little bit more animated. Thank you than, very uh, much. Ms. Bolton over there. Um, thank you. Any questions for Dr. Moffitt on the Health and Safety Committee report? Ms. Bolton. Uh, and maybe I'll raise this uh, when we have a transportation. But, uh, on the crossing guard safety piece and the pedestrian piece, mm -hmm. which is so important, I just will need to know about the number of crossing guards we have and the number of vacancies. I don't know if that's come up. It's come up somewhere along the line, I think maybe in some transportation, but I don't know if that came up in your... It did not. Okay. We did not speak about crossing guards. The, the, the safe... very first meeting. We did talk about yeah, it at the very first meeting. But we didn't get... We didn't. Not in this past meeting. We okay, did not. okay, good. No, we okay. talked about, um, if you guys would like to know, we talked about um, the Schroeder doesn't have a crosswalk. Right. Um, you know, like we talked about Pleasant Ridge Montessori, and they still have that whole, um, they need a raised crosswalk, they've got some safety issues at that intersection. Um, Cairns, we've got, we talked about Walnut Hills, um, there needs to be a crosswalk at Dixmouth and Solstar. Um, Performing Arts needing to have um, the crosswalk on 12th Street. So those are some of, some of the things that we talked Super, about. Super, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Dr. Moffitt? Okay, thank you. I do need a motion to accept the committee reports. So moved. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. I'm giving Mike a second to capture who that was. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? I would like to recuse say aye on all of them. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Uh, committee reports are approved as presented. We're moving now to the section of the agenda for announcements. Does anyone have any kudos that they would like to share? Mr. Murawski? I'd like to give a kudos um, to our friends from the Young Activist Coalition uh, for being back with us in person and for being relentless um, and staying on top of us and helping us to be better, as Dr. Moffitt noted. Um, you know, there are some changes taking place. Uh, I like to think you all have a large part to do with that. Um, and at least in my opinion, we can still do better. Uh, there are too many black and brown students being disproportionately punished, so I appreciate you all keeping it on our radar and staying in our faces. It helps. Thank you, Mr. Murawski. Any other kudos? Dr. Moffat. I want to give a kudos to the great art show that we have in the uh, lobby. Mm -hmm. The, I, I, I swear I'd like to commission some of these students to buy some of their artwork because it is awesome. I don't know how long is it going to be there. Because if you are watching and you can get down here and see some of this artwork from schools across our district, you will be amazed just like myself. May the 2nd, so put it on your uh, to-do list to come down here and check out. Uh, you don't have to do anything special. Just Sign in and walk up and down the hallway, and you will you will really, really be smiling because it's great. Kudos. Thank you very much, Dr. Moffat. Uh, other kudos. Okay, I understand that tonight we do not have any retirements. Um, on announcements, I wanted to say uh, Ramadan Mubarak, happy Ramadan to Muslim members of our community, and Hag Sameach for a happy Passover to anyone celebrating. Uh, any other last announcements? Okay, so we're going to move then to presentations. I understand we have one presentation tonight, which is going to be on transportation um, from Ms. Solano. Is that right? Yes, we're so excited to present this evening. Um, we have the results of the optimization study, and then at the end of the month, you will get a complete proposal of the transportation study. So Ms. Solano will lead us um, with the results of where we are right now. Thank you. Skip to page four. One more. Thank you. So um, this is our transportation timeline. Um, I'm happy to say that we are right on time, right on schedule. And as Interim Superintendent um, Tiani Amat mentioned, I will have the business proposal to you um, this month. Next slide, please. So we continue to have our regular meetings with SORTA. Um, we had eight high school principals join our uh, meeting on Friday to share their concerns. Um, SORTA has been very responsive. 
put some things into place for next fall. And um, the reports that we've asked for, uh, the on-time uh, performance report, I should have the data to share with you at the next meeting. Next slide, please. So this is what I'm really excited to share with the board today. Um, so the optimization study, the pretty much has concluded at this point, it's just um, tweaking here and there. But I'm proud to say that adding 22% more kids on the yellow bus, that's your seventh and eighth graders, we're still able to reduce the number of buses that we're gonna need. Um, our status quo right now is 319 buses, and we are um, believing we could take that down. Actually, we were told 301, plus or minus the tweaking, so that's why we put on here 305. Um, this is actually so so great, because we're looking at a $1.6 million cost savings, which to me, um, the $300,000 that we spent on um, with this company has really turned into a very, very nice ROI. Uh, what I did want to say is initially we thought we were going to have to spend another um, $3 million to have 7th and 8th graders on the bus, but not only are we're not going to need that, we're actually going to save money because of the number of buses that we're going to need. They're actually going to shrink. And this includes adding the seventh and eighth graders, which is about a 22% increase in ridership. Um, kids who live one mile or more, and all the high school start times between 8 and 8.45. So we have the late start times that were starting at 9.15 have all been moved back a half hour, which means um, the, the time that they get out of school has all moved back by half an hour. Um, can't tell. Like, I'm grinning from ear to ear. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. So, um, one of the things that have come up in our meeting with SORTA is that um, bus stop, and I have a picture of it um, down in uh, by Euler. Our kids take the bus um, at 8th Street and Depot, and what that means is they have to like. Um, speed walk or run across A Street and it's not the it's it's not the safest situation. Lo and behold I get an uh, an email from the city and they're applying for a federal grant um and that and they've asked us for a letter of support which I provided and basically they're looking at West A Street, State Lynn, um one of the communities is Lower Price Hill and the goal is to enhance intersections and just overall safety improvement um, for the community. So um, we're really excited about that. I shared that with SORTA. They too um, are very excited about that. So hopefully they'll be able to get that grant and this problem that we've had for many years um, will be resolved. Um, we are gonna, we're continuing to have our meetings with SORTA. Our next meeting, uh, we're inviting the, um, the remaining high school uh, principals that were not able to join us the last two sessions. So I'll have um, some additional reports for you then. Questions for me? Uh, Mr. Moroski. Thank you, President Lindy. Thank you, Ms. Solano. This is awesome. Um, this uh, may uh, show my naivete perhaps, but is there any reason why and I asked this like four years ago and three years ago and two years ago. Is there any reason why you can't just move the bus stop to St. Nath where there is a crosswalk and a stoplight instead of like, I think I'll explain it, put it in another stoplight like 40 yards. So, okay, so there is a bus stop already there. I know, yeah, I know. Um, so why can't we just stop it, it's, there? It's like the, sh the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Um, and so, you know, that's the shortest point to them. The, the kids want to get to the, the, the closest stop versus having to go all the way down to the end to State Street and then cross the street. So. Yeah. You know, hey, look, it's their, yeah, you know, it's their money. I just, yeah, okay. We, uh, my understanding is that the principal has had conversations with kids to remind them, look, there is another bus stop. We want you to do this safely. Um, it does take, 
you know, a little bit longer, maybe a, a minute for them to do that, um, to take that extra walk. But that's not the only issues I think that they're having with just um, traffic in that area. And I think they just want to improve for the, the whole community down there. No, totally. I, I get that. And I wasn't suggesting stop the light. But that I, I totally agree. I live down, down around there. I get It's a nightmare. It's great. It just seems strange. But it's their money. It's great. Good for them. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Moraski. Other questions from board members? Ms. Bolden? Yeah. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm smiling as, as you are. Uh, just a couple things, several things real quickly. Uh, this on the optimization study, which is great. You know, we did that study, but we, we knew not to go ahead with the study regarding the 7th and 8th with the two different, I, we've been working through this and I appreciate it. Are you saying that this, the optimization study included these four bullets that are on your presentation, the 3,000 7th and 8th graders? and the uh, high school start times? Yes, so we actually had several um, options, right? So this was option G. And okay. so based on option G, it was adding the, those seventh and eighth graders on the yellow bus. It was making sure that all of our high school start times were between an eight and 8.45. They're still healthy times, but they're not starting at 9.15. Um, that the riding time, which I failed to mention, was gonna be 55 minutes or less. So based on what they've um, been able to do, 96% of the students are going to be able to get home less, within the 55 minutes. Um, we have another 2% of riders that will be getting home a little bit over an hour, like an hour and 15 minutes. Um, so, what, so what we're looking at is who are those kids? Are they um, are the kids who you know, are going to a high school of choice? They might live on the other sure. side of town. So we are going to be digging further into that. What I do want to tell you is for the babies, on average, their ride time is 23 minutes. So these are our pre-K to six. Um, so as I said, this is just like the in initial preliminary, preliminary data. And then as we see this data and we have questions, we want to be able to make sure that that business plan includes a very comprehensive um, plan so that you have all, you're, you're informed. Uh, and this is just for the yellow bus. So the other part to that, now we're going to not have seventh and eighth graders on the metro. So that's going to be a reduced cost and also reduce congestion at the bus stops because you don't have 3,000 plus kids um, waiting for for the buses as well. Well, and, and I think that's that's very important. And I know that the board felt really strongly about the seventh and eighth grade. That's where we were concentrating. Again, I think I've been the most complimentary of any of the board members about what you've been able to do. I do think this represents a partnership between the administration and the board mm -hmm. to get through this that has been over a year and a half of, of effort. And it's just remarkable. This 55 is instead of the 75 minutes. Did you, on the miles, uh, eligibility starting at one mile for seventh and eighth graders? Yes. Uh, so is that uh, a change or is, uh, and uh, do we classify them as high schoolers? And so they were a mile and a quarter Help so yeah, the seventh. So um, the current the status quo is um, K to six who live one mile or more, and seven through twelve who live 1.25 miles or more. And so um, using the notes that the committee had sent to us to inform the scenarios that we asked the um, company to do, we chose one mile. What does it look like at one mile for right. all of our yellow bus riders? And this is what they were able to come up with. That's excellent. That's absolutely fabulous. And then um, uh, just a few more things right here at the start times and the high schools, have they haven't been notified yet, right? Which are which or? Um, no, they haven't. So <laughs> I guess they will be now. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So now they've been coming. We did share some of this with them at the last sort of meeting, right? So they've been part of the That's process. Um, and so I told them, I said, I have to let the board know first. But um, yeah. the ones who were there on Friday, when we had gotten the results back from the study. They were very excited 
that we were able to push that back a half an hour. Have, have we been able to meet that deadline regarding the charter kids and non-CPS kids being notified, or is that still kind of So we're burner? still waiting for them to, they have to yeah. tell us, so we're still waiting for those. I mean, they still, you know, the initial was April 1st, but they still have some additional times. We are actually going to be meeting with them um, to just discuss the changes in, in how House Bill 110 and how we want to work cooperative with them, cooperatively with them and make sure that their eligible students have the transportation um, so that they can get to school as well. So those meetings are going to be coming up soon. Okay. Um, and then have we received all the data that we've requested from SORTA? So that will be coming. Um, we talked a little bit about that Friday. I know for sure the new optimization reports that use their revised methodology, um, they assured me that I'd have that data so I can share with you um, at the next meeting. Great. And then my last my last point is that you know we have we have and are discussing, I'm sure, the idea that we are willing to compromise on the extra routes. And, and, and indeed, based upon your work, been able to remove the seventh and eighth graders in need of extra routes, and then also using the transfer piece. So I would hope we would start, uh, maybe we can do that in finance or whatever this week or whenever it is, but the idea that we have compromised on the extra routes and they maintain they can't do it. They've kind of gaslighted us about it. It's only about drivers. It's not. It's about their business plan but that would change the number of kids that would need extra routes based upon the transfers. So I, I hope we can be talking about that as we go further into this. But congratulations, this is great work, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased, and I know there's still a long way to go. Will the special needs kids be able to get to the high schools, and we can still stay at that those times? So I know that's yeah, so, creating the, 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 no, excuse me, there's, that was creating part of the problem of getting those start times at the right time. So it's yes. great that you've been able to address that. Yeah, this is this covers all of our babies. So the, the K to eight on a yellow bus, plus the PK through 12 special needs students. Super, very much. Thank you, Ms. Bolton. Uh, Ms. Jones, and then yeah. I have a couple. Just a quick comment. Um, I just wanna say thank you. I ditto um, Ms. Bolton's concerns and positive comments about where to work. I remember last year when we were struggling with this, and one of the things that we agreed upon it was that there were things that we had to do ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, not that uh, we don't want to have a partnership with them and we don't want to sort of force the issue with them about some of our concerns, but that we felt obligated to take care of our students. And I think I attribute that to the hard work that, that you've done and appreciate the thought that board members um, are given to this and, and the work that you've done to make sure that we've reached that goal. So I just wanna say thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. I wanted to offer my thanks as well, Connie. Um, did you have anything, Mr. Craig, before I go? I, I just want to say I really appreciate seeing this, and I also think this is an example of when we do it the right way, we can actually find out the results are better than we expected. Mm -hmm. And so I think I would look forward to being able to do more things like this, where we are able to put in some efficiencies into the system to make things better. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what we're seeing is that we're going to deliver a great service for the students, cheaper costs, but because we're doing it in a better, more systematic way. If I could say it's it's really been a group effort. It really has. Yeah. Um, thanks, Mr. Craig. Thanks, Connie. Um, can, I, uh, can I add something? Yeah, Ms. Martin. I just want to also let the board know that we are setting up a meeting up with Ms. Uh, Wright uh, with Sorter so she can be a part of those discussions. Um, one of the first meetings uh, we had was an introduction to Ms. Solano, so she is aware of the process from beginning to end, and then I can pass the baton and she can take it uh, from there. I also would like to respond to the question, which is around safety, around the crossing guards. We have a total of 144 cr crossing guards with only 98% uh, 98, uh, 98 of those 144 are filled. So yes, 
So we have to do some recruiting and have some discussion uh, around that. But we are working with the city. Uh, Mr. Uh, Bell is a part of um, that discussion as well. If people are watching this or the press is covering this, where can people apply to be a crossing guard? With the city. Great. It's Thank you very city. much. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I'm going to get a, just a couple comments in from Ms. Solano here before I before we uh, um, move on, because um, I didn't get a chance to ask my question, so I'm going to do that real quick. Um, uh, one was, um, I, I wanted to just make sure I was following this correctly around the cost savings from the um, optimization study. So I saw that it was 1.6 million. Is that per year? Um, yes. So it's much more than 1.6 million. I mean, we're, we're, we spent 300,000 on the study, and we're going to see a, a savings of 1.6 million annually. Right. Well, right, because that was based on um, what we projected would be the additional cost if we just did status quo and just got extra buses, um, and then the additional reduction of like 15 buses, the cost of that. And so, as a result, it, it was saving us 1.6 in the sense that. Um, we were looking at what we were going to have to have to spend extra to put these kids on the bus. Um, so yeah, so in a sense, based on this year's budget, if we had not put the seventh and eighth graders on the bus, we'd probably even, you know, be saving a lot more from this year's budget. Sure, I just think that it's it's a long term deal, uh, and I think that I think that's that's really fantastic, and I wanted right. to say thank you. Um, the the last things I wanted to check on was when we. Um, when we had the um, priority setting conversation for the three months between March 7th and June 13th, transportation was one of the things that rose up to one of the most foremost important. Uh, so I'm so glad that we're talking about this. Um, and when we, when we as a group said, you know, here's what we want to see three months from now, uh, one, we said two things. One was that in whatever plan we adopt, there's clear measures of success for next school year whether that's about ride times or whether that's about, um, I imagine ride times and how long you have to walk to bus stops uh, and, and, and family satisfaction, whatever you all decide. But in the, in the plan that gets proposed, will we see not just how much it costs and what it does, but what the outcomes are? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can do that. We, we can come up with um, some indicators um, that are measurable. That's great. That's great. I think I, I will. I know that that's the, that's the first thing I'd, I'm excited to ask questions about. Um, and then the, the the other piece there that we said in the the board priorities was that, was that they be informed meaningfully by community feedback. Whatever whatever the transportation plan is, and I'm, I'm not asking for a report on that tonight. I just wanted to surface up. These are the things that I, I hope we ask about when we're evaluating whatever plan comes forward. Is it is it really clear on what winning would be for next year? Um, and can we say with some confidence that it really does reflect not just what we think is important, but also what the community thinks? And if we can, if we can check those two boxes, and I have every reason to believe we will, um, I think it'll be a, a wonderful plan. And I would just like to add, we have um, gathered data from the community ahead of time, so that's what has lend direction for decisions. Um, a prime example of that was the seventh and eighth graders getting on the. The yellow bus but once the final plan is presented to the uh, board we can also um, do some sort of survey but the community has been a part of this process from the very beginning that's great and I, I'm not I'm not requesting one way to do it there are lots of ways to do it uh, I just think that those were the, the, the I think the criteria we said we'd use um, when we adopt the final um, so thank you I appreciate it uh, okay, so if that ends our presentation section, I think we're ready to move into board matters. We have a couple different items tonight. Um, several of these are on here from uh, Mrs. Weinberg. Um, for example, the first two items, um, a discussion of gun storage and Vision Zero. Um, is there another board member who'd like to present those? Or I'm also happy to table them until we have her next time. I think that that was in regards to the presentation from Moms Demand Action okay. and wanting to have them come and present at a board meeting. Okay. Um, so I think that the request is just, can they come and present to us at, at a board meeting? The SMART program. Mm -hmm. SMART and Moms Demand Action? Yes. Yeah. 
we did have the Vision Zero folks too. Uh, but was she, was she requesting a presentation? The, for the Vision Zero, that was at the request of Board Member Jones that said we needed to have some con continuity from the work that you Excellent. all did, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, around Vision Zero so that we could be informed in our dealings with the city. Report to you, to the committee. Yes. Well, and also it ties very closely, I think, with number three, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which was mine. Be yes, <laughs> because there it was being discussed how we might partner with the city. And so the suggestion was, well, let's first talk to the full board about where we are with Vision Zero and get some information. And then the next part of that was um, a question about um, reinstating the work group with the city and so, do you want to speak then to that, Dr. Moffat, a little bit? On number three? Yeah. Yes. Well, the city has actually, you know, it's no secret, we, they're wanting to have a relationship with us. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, in speaking with Board Member Jones, specifically in the Health and Safety Committee, but then in asking for direction on other things, um, there was a committee that was established that did, that provided co continuity between the district and CPS previously. And so, um, We've been able to direct and help Ms. Solano get some things done, make some connections with the city because they've asked, hey, what, what are you all working with? We give her honey, um, but we wanted to formalize that. And so whatever that looks like as far as reinstatement or to develop something new, I will say is also, um, they, the, I was talking to one of the council members who shared that a lot of our students, our CPS students, get recognized by the city, the resolutions and proclamations, and they thought it would be really nice to have once a month CPS students off, um, recognized. And so I thought that is something in addition to what we're talking about regarding health and safety that could be formalized as well with the same committee. So, so it sounds like that um, there's probably some, some history that folks might share uh, if they'd like about what this used to look like. Um, yeah. yeah. Ms. Jones? Well, last year, probably late summer, uh, we did bring that to the full board uh, because it was requested by formal, former council member, Betsy Sunderman, um, through a conversation that I believe she had with a former board member and uh, wondering if, about uh, the status of the, what was it, the ACES? Is that what it was called? It was ACES. ACES committee. And that ACES committee was a committee of the board plus the education committee, which council no longer has. I think they restructured how they do that work. And um, we used to, that, that group used to meet on a quarterly basis. And we made the decision last year to defer that at least until after the elections um, and said we could revisit it. And so that's how we came to that conversation. Um, now, I, I think um, it is worthy of a conversation from the full board about whether or not there's an interest in doing that or how we might partner better or differently with city council. I think what I was gauging at that time is that there wasn't a whole lot of interest in reestablishing ACEs as it was structured. But I don't know. That's why we said let's bring yeah. it to the full board. <laughs> That's really helpful. And I think um, just having spoken to some people already and kind of um, watching our new board members over the course of the campaign uh, season and also on when people were sworn in and how much wonderful, I think, um, shared ownership there was for the outcome of the fall election. Um, and also that I think, yeah, please tell me if I'm wrong, but that all of us want to leverage every resource possible on behalf of the kids and families and CPS. Um, my hunch is that some kind of effort to see what we can do together is something everybody would support. Um, I mean, is there anybody who's opposed to the idea of there being uh, some formalized way that we try to coordinate to better align with the city? I would, I would, I'm not opposed to it. I was, I was glad when we suspended it, when we suspended it and then waited till we had a new board and there was a new council and possibly a new mayor. There are a number of easy things we could do uh, to, to, a lot better. And then there are very pressing issues. One of them is this transportation. We're going to need city council to help us with this crossing guard thing and bus stops and also to try to 
uh, uh, advocate for our students uh, with, with SORTA since they appoint half of the SORTA board. And then keep in mind the treasurer is already lining up uh, some uh, effort, as I recall, and we reported in the minutes about CRAs and, and what have you. With the, so there's they're very heavy lifting kind of issues, and I I think a quarterly meet and an actual whether it's uh, maybe not be joint, but maybe it would be a, a board members that could attend, and certainly whichever committee that the council thinks would be best. I think it's very important to do that. So, so my proposal would then, and Dr. Moffat, tell me if this if this works with you, we can do something different, is to have maybe two board members who would want to serve as a group to figure out with the city what what name this group should have, how it should be constituted, how often it should meet, so that, that they don't have to make figure out some of the details here with all seven of us, but could try to work something out with the city and then come back with a proposal. We could talk about it, I think likely adopt it, uh, and then move forward. Um, so then we need two people. Um, I would like to ask Dr. Moffat to be one of them if she's willing to do that. Um, and we'll give you one collaborator. Is there anybody who would who would like to do that alongside Dr. Moffat? Okay, don't everybody uh, rush to do it. I, I, I can tell that you guys are excited. Mr. Craig, fabulous. <laughs> the dream team. We have Dr. Moffat and Mr. Craig who are gonna build a new future uh, with the city of Cincinnati. Um, and I think I think I think that's that's an unambiguously good thing. Let's not call it Aces, though. No, Please. adverse childhood experiences is not going to be the name of our okay. uh, pros kid. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, no, a better name. So now, what does that? Can you all share with me what does that look like? Does that look like um, something that we bring back on the we, we we report monthly to the full board? What is what has had what has that been in the past? What do we want it to look like? And I'll and I'll give you an example. Um, Vice Mayor Kearney has healthy neighborhoods. And so she's asked the question, what do you all need? What do your kids need for this healthy neighborhoods mm -hmm. committee that they have? Mike, do you have a question? No, just to respond to her, you know, I think if I if I understood it correctly, the, the, the task from the president is that there are representatives from this body work with representatives from the city to figure out what the, the larger body looks like. Because it would okay. we're not talking about two folks working with city council and reporting to us. We're talking about all seven of us working with all nine of them on substantive Correct. issues like four times a year or something. That's what the ACES well, was. Yeah, well, what I just heard is that we didn't want to do ACES. No, we don't. But, 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 my, but my question was not to have just a report from those two people. I'm saying my question is broader than that. What does what do we want that to look like? Do we want that to look like formalized meeting from, or is that what we're just exploring? That's what you all are gonna, okay. I think, figure so that, out. That I will right. say, I will say, if I may, <clears throat> I'll speak for myself. <clears throat> when I say I don't want it to look like ACEs, what I mean is I don't want it to look like a photo op for a few city council folks like the last committee was. Okay. That's what I mean. Because we didn't talk about anything. But there should be some substance. substance. We didn't talk about anything substance. What was the purpose of ACEs? Like, what was, I don't know. Well, I mean, it started, can, I think it had good intention. It was Ms. Bolton and it was uh, Mr. Sinfield, right? Initially, you? Well, I think, can I get a little history? Because we, we just said we don't want it to be like that. And I don't have any idea what that was. Okay. Yeah. But, but it was it was an effort there. It, you know, it's the, it's the, what are the two circles that come together? There are places where we completely intersect with one another and mm -hmm. need each other. And whether it's celebrating our kids or whether it's uh, transportation or whether it's, neighborhood development, I mean, whatever it would be, where we see an intersection, then that's what the topics would be. So what happened was that the council submitted topics that they would like to see in a year's agenda, and, and it ended up being just that one committee, and then we <clears throat> submitted topics that we felt would, would be, you know, benefit from a mutual effort, and then from that, there was a, a year-long agenda that was drawn up, and there were public meetings. All these meetings have to be public. They can't be private. And so um, that's what we did, and it's an unfortunate name, but it was, it was uh, an effort to see where we intersect and then show the people and the voters and the community that we are working together instead of at odds with one another. And it worked for a yeah. while, hey, but I only also, a while. Yeah, and what we did was alternate the quarterly meetings, and it, they were co-facilitated. Now that in itself presented some problems. Okay. 
because it then became pretty one-sided. And I, I, I just think the overall intent and purpose of it really kind of lost the mo momentum as, okay. you know, the farther, the older it got. But, but it can work. I just oh, think absolutely. we have to establish some different parameters around it. Do you feel, Dr. Moffitt, like that gives you the kind of clarity you need in Mr. Craig? Do you have any other outstanding questions? I don't have any other questions. I think what we can talk with the uh, council about is, you know, one, they're also made a lot of changes on council and how they're operating yeah. as well. And so just ensuring that we are able to do something that'll be effective uh, for the students of CPS first and foremost, and that we can do something that's collaborative with them is, is a great idea. And so I'm excited to work with Dr. Moffat on that. Thank you all very much. Um, we're moving then, this is also for Dr. Moffat, I think, an uh, update or reminder about Ms. Wright's first day on May 2nd. I had a note so, that that was added. So I think that we just wanted to formally tell the community that um, our incoming superintendent was is coming on effective May 2nd. And until that time, we have interim superintendent um, Tiana Amat. So there's no confusion with people on when the superintendent is coming and starting. People don't have to send confusing um, information. It is Ms. Amat until May 1st and then May 2nd. Um, Ms. Wright. Thank you, Dr. Moffitt. Um, I think I have some things I'd like to bring up around House Bill 616, which I put on there. Um, the folks have seen this, I would imagine, either in the press or from our government affairs group or um, on social media. But there is a bill proposed um, in the Ohio House, Bill 616, um, that to me is, is uh, and we heard uh, President Sellers say this in hearing of the public, um, just awful. Uh, and, and I think the way that it um, prohibits uh, any discussion of sexual orientation or gender identity for students below a certain age. Uh, it actually makes it against Ohio law to use the 1619 project as any part of your curriculum. Um, and I'd like to share, you know, my hope that uh, as a school district, um, maybe not tonight, but at an upcoming meeting, um, we might uh, say something, uh, pass a resolution or something um, against that bill. Um, that's my perspective. It's just my perspective. I'm not sure about the perspectives of the other board members up here, but I wanted to put it on the agenda tonight and then hear from people about, um, you know, my hope would be we could ask our communications team to put together a resolution that we could um, see ahead of time and then vote to approve at our next meeting. Uh, and I'd love to hear just if anybody likes that idea, thinks that's a terrible idea, um, and then go from there. Ms. Jones. Yeah, I, I fully support um, a resolution for that. I also think these are the, you know, we hear about this stuff is coming down the pike so fast. And I think it's important for our liaisons to really keep us abreast, especially when we asked about it, like when are they gonna be presented in the General Assembly? Because it may even be worth our while to show our faces and to encourage students, to encourage CFT and other our unions um, to really come go to the General Assembly to pub, do public speaking around that. So, um, uh, you know, it, that's that's where I am with it. It's a yes and, yes. I hear. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Marski. I adamantly support uh, drafting a resolution and voting on it as this body um, that makes it very, very clear that we do not support anything in this bill. You know, <clears throat> unfortunately, <clears throat> um, what I was saying down here to uh, my colleagues that sit near me is, unfortunately, these people in Columbus don't care about our testimony. They don't care about our kids. Uh, many of them actually don't like our kids because of how our kids look and because of what the parents do for a living, whatever that may be. Um, and unfortunately, that's just the way it is. And I think any way we can fight this hateful kind of uh, legislation is important. I do think it's of note to call out that this recent don't say gay, as they're calling it the media piece that was thrown into this bill, 
was largely an attempt to revive a bill that was dead. I think it's worth noting in public session that the, one of the co-sponsors of this original bill, 616, the divisive concepts bill, had kind of, you know, shot herself in the foot when she said you needed to teach both sides of the Holocaust. And the Republican Speaker of the House told her to take a seat, and the bill kind of died. And this most recent don't say gay bit is an attempt to revive it. You know, my hope is that this thing dies, but I think it's important that, that we, being charged with overseeing kids' education, urban school district especially, take a stance. So I applaud the president for putting it on the agenda. I'll support in any way I can. Good night. Thanks, Mr. Moraski. Can we just hear from folks who haven't gone yet, and then we'll come over to the clarifying like question? A, can I, a, a, just a, a follow-up comment, one, follow-up comment on that, that mm -hmm. there are many other bills similar to this coming down the pike. And, and so where this one might die, there are many others that follow that. Thank you. Ms. Bolton? I think there should be a resolution from the locally elected uh, school board, us, uh, in opposition to this and those sorts of things that are generated by it. Um, I also don't want us to take the bait uh, of the political people that are trying to make us discuss this instead of all the other things that we need to be discussing. Because uh, that's what they're doing. They're, 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 that's what they're doing. And uh, but we must take a stand for, for our kids and our families. And as as people that are duly elected locally, um, but I, I I hope we don't necessarily find a way to fully engage in the dialogue with these people. But yes, we must take a stand. Thank you, Ms. Bolton. Mr. Craig. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think we, we a board resolution is a great way of also indicating that we support all of our students in this district. And I think that's the biggest message that we can send when any of these types of bills come forward is that we're not here for any one or two students, but we're here for every student in our district. Make sure every student in our district has an opportunity to have an inclusive education that respects and appreciates them and their history. Um, and I don't think these type of bills do that, but I think more importantly, our role as a board is to support and and bring a district that will include every student that's in our district. And so I think a board resolution would be a great way to demonstrate that. Thank you. Any last comments? We, um, well, I think we should, we're proud of, uh, as a board and as a district of both our equity policy and the anti-racism policy. And it feels like an opportunity to, to be public to what our values are. Um, uh, in, in hopes of a better future. So thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I think we're gonna move then um, towards the end of our agenda this evening. We are finished with board matters, moving into the superintendent of schools. Um, Interim Superintendent Amat, is there a report you'd like to share this evening? Absolutely, Rob, can you bring up the report? I will start off by congratulating our Hawkins Award finalist, Yay. Western Yay. Southern Hawkins Award Honors, one educator of the year who has elevated educational process in our public schools. And on May 5th, the uh, winner will be announced and will receive $10,000. Um, and I do want to take the time to say their name individually. Okay. Um, I think it's important. Clayton Adams, Aiken High School, Michael Brown, South Avondale, Allison Burns, Woodward, uh, Laura Coyne, Academy of World Languages, John Crawford, Reese Price, Shirley Eastley, Chase School, Jody Hammond, Midway, Eric Higgins is our principal, Clark Montessori, Katie Hansberger, uh, Gamble Elementary, Candace Jones, Woodward, uh, Valicia Kelly Hughes High School, Mark Messily High Park School, Lindsay uh, Nyberding Westwood, Jennifer Nyman Roberts, Lori Owens, uh, CPS, William Shaw Walnut Hills, Stacey Shockley Matthews Nam, and Caitlin Taylor Lighthouse. Let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs> On to our citywide student art show. Big shout out to Dr. Rudnick and his vision in working with all of our art teachers across the district. Um, art, our art featured more than 400 pieces in grades K through 12, from painting, sculptures, 
uh, photography, and more, and it's open to the public Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30, now through May 2nd. I also want to acknowledge ABC uh, activities beyond the classroom for their help and support in sponsoring this event. Read Across CPS, this is an effort to continue encouraging our students and families to love literacy and meet our every first grade Greater Reads goal. Um, so we have been hosting author visits and literacy nights across the district and students will receive a free book and talk about reading. Read Across Madisonville, uh, this is our sixth annual Read Across Madisonville event, which uh, this year celebrates the rich history of HBCUs. Uh, the event will take place April 20. We have published authors in third and fourth grade uh, at uh, John P. Parker, and this is their book, Our Voices and Imagination in Ink, and it's a collection of stories from our students. So not only they're readers, they're great writers, published authors. <laughs> uh, exciting news, CTE um, opportunities are coming. We were award, awarded $100,000 from ODE in a grant to increase graduation rates specifically for our CTE students. Big shout out to uh, Mike Turner and his team uh, for writing the grant and, and having a great vision to support the graduation of our students. But just this past weekend, Evanston students won the UC Robotics Contest. And it was led by Ms. Deidre Simpson. So we're really proud of our students in that effort and it was several uh, districts and uh, across the city and our uh, kids came home with the win. We also uh, want to take a moment to acknowledge Ms. Tammy Gilmore and Ms. Mildred Kennedy. They put on a fantastic career fair uh, this past week at uh, FC Cincinnati um, and the students participated and it was a huge success. So again, partnerships with our resource coordinators. And then we have uh, two more things. Vaccination clinics are coming up. So we have one coming uh, Thursday at Hughes High School, um, and then Rockdale Academy and South Avondale. And then lastly, just some reminder of important dates. The citywide art show is here up until May uh, 2nd. Midterm week is April 18th. Earth Day is April 22nd, and Roberts will have a community cookout April 30th. That concludes my report, and I submit my written report for your approval. Thank you. Thank you, Interim Superintendent Lamont. Do we have a motion to accept the superintendent's report this evening? So moved. Oh, second. We have a motion from Mr. Morosky, second from Ms. Jones. Any discussion? Mr. Gustin. Thank you. Ms. Bolton. Aye. Mr. Craig? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Dr. Moffitt? Yes. Mr. Morosky? Yes. President Lindy? Yes. Wonderful. Um, so we have the uh, superintendent's report passed. On the treasurer's report, uh, we need a motion to introduce the treasurer's report. So move. Is there a second? Second. Uh, so for discussion, I think we have two items I know of. We may have more. Um, I think we should chat about governance for a little bit because people had some questions when we did that um, priorities update at the beginning. Um, I, I feel very excited about the recommendation that came from Mike and from Brandon, um, and I intend to continue supporting their recommendation for where we go next, um, and that is um, you know, tough for me because I, I do also think extraordinarily highly of the Alma Group uh, and would be happy to provide a positive reference for anybody who would like one. Um, but if anybody has questions, uh, Ms. Jones, Ms. Bolton, um, I wanted to return to that topic from earlier. Ms. I, Ms. Jones? Yeah, I, um, I'm fully supportive of uh, Council of Great City Schools, that contract. Um, I do feel very strongly that we could have a, if we could have a conversation about how 
if there was a good fit in terms of the strategic planning process as Ms. Bolton has been describing it, um, and any opportunities that might be available to us for that. Not today, but maybe at a different meeting. And this is uh, to talk about, not tonight, but at a different meeting? Yeah. Okay, that, that's absolutely fine. I just wanted to make sure before we ask people to vote on the on the um, East on right. the council that people got their questions answered. Yeah. Ms. Bolton? Well, as you all were, will recall, I gave it a green um, and was the only person, including the people that recommended this, didn't even give it a green. Um, pitiful. Um, but green but, it is but it, 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 but then, then we're, we're wrong to do any of this because it's oh. not all going to ever be done until it's done. So I mean, that, so I was That's thinking right. as to where we are, this is as done as anything else on this list. But um, my, my thought very strongly is that I do not want to engage in another RFP for a firm to come and lead us and facilitate our strategic planning. And we will need another firm to do that. There will have to be somebody that facilitates it. And indeed, within this RFP, uh, letter K says this RFP may be awarded to a single vendor or multiple vendors on order to meet the service requirements of the RFP. So it would seem to me that we had three vendors that we kind of said okay to and then got deeper into <clears> it. And, and these folks properly recommended for good reason, uh, Great City Schools, and I'm supportive of that. But it would seem to me that what we need to do, uh, and I think this would help move the governance piece along as well as would allow us to get a, a good start on a strategic plan, is to look at the various parts of this RFP <clears throat> that would lend themselves to strategic planning. And there are parts in this talking about yeah. reaching out to the community, de developing priorities and what have you, uh, various ass uh, assessments, performance related to identified competencies, uh, assist in establishing skills, for marshalling external resources. It would seem to me that we could say the governance piece could be led, and I'm ready to vote yes on that, but we could subdivide part of this, since you guys didn't even say about the money, you were saying that one of the attractions of this was that it was up to 100,000 or what have you, and this could be part of it, and they even were talking about negotiating something less or whatever. So it seems to me the consensus, consensus builder, the consensus would be you have some group that's already got crit with the community, somebody that's also done more extensive involvement with the community than I can remember in 15 years. It is also a minority owned business that we've now turned to, you know, said no <clears> to. <throat> and I think, I, I think we should vote to have the, and the governance and the strategic plan should not be the same. I think those are two very different issues and approaches. So I, I my, think so. My recommendation would be that, yeah, we'll vote for the governance piece and that we would then ask the Alma people to look at this RFP again and, and look at those things that could be part of our strategic plan since we want to start it. I mean, literally in, in, in less than a couple of months. Yeah, and I think this is good for a next discussion about how we want to think about strategic planning. I don't think we're having that decision tonight or that discussion tonight, but I do think these are important things that we can revisit in that context. So I, 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 any other last thoughts on the uh, governance RFP before we keep moving? Yeah. I just wanted to make sure we're clear that what we're voting on today is just because what Great City offered is in the initial 20,000 boards, the session they would do on board governance, meet and greet type deal. The rest of it is still stuff that we would have to finalize and decide upon. But I do think to your point, Eve, um, and to your point, Carolyn, that we could do the strategic plan stuff as something separate altogether out of there. I, was, I don't know that it was ever something, at least my understanding or intention on having it be part of our board development part. Uh, but really focus them on a narrow set of things that we can have them work on, and then the other stuff can be left to uh, the strategic planning and the other aspects of it can be left to something to someone else. Thank you, Mr. Greg. Any any last comments on governance, Dr. So, Moppet? So I, first of all, I think that we should definitely vote on the government governance piece. 
But I feel as if you are looking to specifically to have Alma do something rather than to have the best person or group do something. And, and, and that concerns me. I'm just, I'm just saying this publicly. We, we're voting on Council of Gray City Schools and then we can maybe solicit and have a, a request for proposals to solicit other people, but to say that it has to be a specific group for whatever the reasons that you're listing concerns me that we're not necessarily opening that, that, up, that net up to the best, but we're trying to go with what we know. And I don't know if that is necessarily the best. So I say we vote on this and then talk about strategic planning later. That's not what this was about, but I do wanna make it known that um, you know, I'm not, I'm not agreeing to table this specifically for Alma. I'm agreeing to get this started with Council Gray City Schools and then we can come back and maybe solicit other proposals, include Alma, but that's not, that's, I just wanted to be very clear. I'm not saying that I'm gonna table this for Alma. Yeah, I think no, no decision is being made or asked to be made tonight as okay, it relates to strategic planning. Sounds good. Um, and I think it's an important, I appreciate you saying that, I think it's important to make it clear for everybody. Um, okay, so to, second. I have, to, I have to respond to that because you just said, I'm, I'm trying to find work for Alma. Uh, I, I'm not an agent of Alma. I just know that we've lived through more almost a year of working with Alma, who has already done so much of the work that we wanna get done and will be working from. So I'm happy to vote for, uh, as I said, I voted green. Uh, for great city schools, but I, I'll tell you, um, I, I hope that we take up this question of the strategic plan uh, the, at the next meeting, because in order to get a good start on it, you're gonna have to, either you're issuing a new RFP, or we are finding as we work through this RFP, as Mr. Craig has said, part of that can be the Alma Group. But yes. So we'll, 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 I think, important conversations to, to continue having. But there's a second piece to the treasurer's report I want to make sure I also share, which is that um, uh, board members have requested to clarify. So uh, for Mike, um, board members are requesting the treasurer to expand on the narrative in item seven, uh, Roman numeral seven. Uh, this relates to our separation agreement mutually agreed between the board and interim superintendent Amat. The board is very grateful to the interim superintendent for her leadership over the last year, and we wish her every success in future endeavors. In the interest of being fully transparent, we're asking the treasurer to include the actual dollar amount of the payment to Ms. Amat, including salary and accrued leave. So Mr. Gustin, can you share with the treasurer that the board would like uh, that to be included in the amount, in the final version that gets posted? Yes, we can do that. Great, thank you very much. Uh, do are there any other discussion points or questions about the treasurer's report? We need a motion. Uh, we have a motion, we have a second already. So can you, uh, Mr. Gustin, please call the vote. Sure, Ms. Bolton? Aye. Mr. Craig? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Dr. Moffitt? Yes. Mr. Morosky? Yes. President Lindy? Yes, thank you. We are now on inquiries and updates. Do board members have any inquiries or updates? I have one. I'll be very quick. Um, I, I see every once in a while on um, the New York Times just uh, updates on the next COVID wave. This was something called BA2 that was announced or that was covered just over the weekend um, with some case increases on the East Coast. Uh, I have just some um, uh, memories of Omicron, and I'm wanting to check to make sure that we're doing everything we possibly can to be ahead of whatever the next wave is. Um, I don't know how concerned or unconcerned we should be about wh what was in the article on this BA2 variant, and I was just hoping we could hear from the administration, um, we shouldn't be worried at all, and here's why, or here's what we're doing to make sure we're in front of it, or we need more time to figure it out, but, but just to get some update for us and the public on that. Good evening. So thank you for your question. Um, in conversations with medical professionals at the Cincinnati Health Department and Cincinnati Children's this afternoon, they indicated that we are not seeing community increases at this time in our area. As you may remember, there are three factors that we're looking at to closely monitor this in our community. One of those being occupancy, hospitalization, and the community cases. 
and CPS, in addition to monitoring those community factors, we are really still um, paying very close attention to the data, continuing with our daily meetings each and every day at four o'clock, and then the weekly meetings with the broader sector of all of the leadership from those two organizations I mentioned, paying close attention to student attendance, staff attendance, and positive cases. The other piece that our medical friends um, really highlighted are in New York City and Philadelphia where they are seeing increased cases right now. The hospitalization rates are not increasing as of yet, knock on wood. So the cases they are seeing um, primarily are in younger age people who are recovering. And thank you, Susan, so much for this. And, and, and no um, big worry I have is that we would for some reason need to be virtual. Like, no, you're not something you're, I know we're almost at the end of the school year, but that's that's not something that's concerning to you all. Not at this point. That's great. Thank you so much. Any other inquiries? Mr. Morosky? I just remembered, no, I have an update. Or it's not even an update, it's an announcement, so I'm gonna say it. Um, I wanna say happy Black Maternal Health Week to all of our black moms in our district. It was, uh, it was a week that uh, was celebrated and a lot of events took place in my old job. It's the only reason I know it's Black Maternal Health Week um, when I was working on infant mortality. So. To two of our three board members, happy Black Maternal Health Week, Dr. Moffitt, Ms. Jones, and Ms. Weinberg, who's not here. And again, um, thanks to all the moms in the district that help our district go round. So thank, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morosky. Do we have any assignments this evening? Ms. Bolton. Yes, thank you. Um, for the administration, uh, I would like to know, let's see how I say this, I'd like to know how much we pay the city and for what on crossing guards. We know that it's our, their salary and wages. Uh, I'd like to know if we are paying their benefits or other uh, items, what's the full compensation. Uh, and it'd be great to see a location uh, of crossing guard assignments and the ones that are vacant. Uh, and then uh, the other assignment, if I might, Mr. President, a clarification, because we had some discussion, I think last time, about the number of students in our summer scholars program that, w that occurred last year, and I guess whatever we know about this coming year, uh, and the number of staff and the, the dollar amount, that would be great. Any other assignments? Along the, summer, along the summer scholars data, I, do we have, we, if, have we collected data from last year's summer scholars? Can we get just a report on that? Yes, it was, we presented yeah. maybe you last presented month okay. on it. Yes, the, the okay. academic data? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Jones? Um, they presented some of that and we asked for some more specific data around Great. the numbers. So uh, we could just remind them, We and I'll, take responsibility for that to remind them to get those numbers. They did give us an update, I just don't know off the top of my head. Any last assignments before we close tonight? Ms. Jones? Just real quick, just to ask our staff if they could take a few minutes to gather the information on give it to the two members who work with. That's a great idea. There's tons of it for you. Thank Enjoy. Uh, so <laughs> having no other business before us, I declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you.